Welcome everyone to Exercise for Osteoporosis in Conversation with. My name is Francine Zimbalist and I am the founder, innovator and educator at Exercise for Osteoporosis. Today is Exercise for Osteoporosis in Conversation with biomedical engineer, Professor Clinton Rubin. Professor Rubin, PhD, is the director of the Centre for Biotechnology at Stony Brook University in Stony Brook, New York. His research is targeted towards understanding the cellular mechanisms responsible for bone health, growth, healing and homeostasis, or simply put, balance. His research orientates around the establishment of non-drug treatment strategies through mechanical stimuli for osteoporosis, obesity and diabetes. Dr. Rubin holds 30 patents in the area of wound repair, stem cell regulation and treatment of metabolic disease and is the founder of Exogen, Juvent, Maradine Medical and Lahara Bio. He has a published over 300 articles and has been cited 35,000 times. And I just remembered, I forgot to ask him whether I was pronouncing all of those um, companies correctly. So I'll, I'll ask him now. Welcome, um, uh, Professor Rubin. Uh, thanks, it's, it's lovely to join you. The only, um, I guess, verbal clarification I would make is that I call them patents and not patents. But right, I, okay. Fine. Uh, <laughs> that might happen again throughout the yeah, chat today. Um, let's dive straight in. Um, so I wanted to, um, uh, I, I was wondering if you could tell me a bit about what your work involves and a little bit of personal history. Um, how did you get into this particular field of study? So if we go way back when to the very beginning. Right. Uh, uh, again, thanks to you and your listeners for allowing me to, to jump into their lives and their earbuds and talk about uh, my work. I'm very interested in how mechanical signals influence nature. I think that um, uh, without getting into too much grisly detail, I sort of always, when I was a kid, wanted to grow up to be an architect and uh, was very interested in form and function. Um, but I figured out that I wasn't really creative enough to make really cool buildings, et cetera. And I also knew that humans were never going to outsmart nature. So I started to look at how um, sort of functional demands influence the architecture of your body through history, through the beginning of time, um, primarily in vertebrates, uh, but also how this sort of form and function rules of nature might be harnessed somehow to treat diseases, diseases uh, like osteoporosis and obesity. So I think that uh, I come to being a scientist through frustration from lack of architectural creativity. Today we're going to be talking about um, uh, a particular um, uh, product that you are behind, a low intensity vibration. And I'm really interested to understand actually how clinical studies are done. Are they done in a test tube? Are they done on animals? Are they done on people? Um, what, what, where does it start? Well, it, it depends on sort of uh, a scientist philosophy, but I, I think that 99.9% .9 of those in the biomedical community ascribe to the, the goals of first do no harm. And you know, the way to most safely launch into studying uh, the potential benefits versus the consequences of a new therapeutic is to work in cells outside of the body, outside of a living organism, to sort of study how a cell might sense a chemical or sense a physical signal, and sort of the steps that a cell takes to adapt or respond to the signal, again, being it a, a drug, or in my case, uh, something like a mechanical challenge. So in these cases, working on cells, let's say that you grow in an incubator, um, these are considered in vitro or outside of life. Um, and then to get to the clinic, to actually uh, try uh, study efficacy of a new drug or a new device on humans, most often you go to protect the human through stages which are called preclinical or animal studies. And uh, you know, to be perfectly frank with your audience, you know, I have, I've studied um, new interventions for humans 
first by looking at how they might influence animals. And we use everything from mice and rats, we have turkeys, sheep, um, the, the whole gamut, and then the final human being, uh, people themselves. So when any investigator, be it a pharmaceutical or a biotech company or a medical device company, or whether we are graduate students or professors in an academic institution, in order to translate your science to being a new treatment for a human, often uh, described as cliche of bench to bedside research, that you go through a number of stages to demonstrate efficacy, but also to demonstrate safety. And I think that um, as many reservations as I personally have about doing research on, on animals, um, I think that uh, I am very, very careful in my work with, with animals. And I think that um, it's a very important step to ensure that uh, new interventions are first safe for humans. Right. So um, if we just look now, um, I'm sure my viewers and listeners would love to understand your way of explaining this. Um, we're going to talk about bones today. And um, the, I wanted to discuss the evolution of bone health and what, what do we know about bones in the body and how they remain strong in order to perform their role. What is the natural and or typical evolution of the skeleton from birth through immaturity into maturity and aging? So I guess we're, we're going to end up with the problem and then talk about the solution. Sure, yeah, let me see if I can tackle that. It's a, it's a, it's a big question and when you think of bones and you know, look at the fossil record and when people are digging up bones, be they dinosaur bones or be there even human bones, and they try to examine and understand what that dinosaur was doing 60 million years ago or whatever. Um, the only real evidence we have of sort of the growth, the evolution of vertebrates, of, of bone-bearing animals, is through the fossil record. And so we have to project based on what a femur or a thigh bone looks like, what was that dinosaur doing? And you know, what you have to do is we know that these dinosaurs probably were not taking anti-resorptives or uh, anabolic therapies for osteoporosis. They were munching on trees or munching on other dinosaurs or whatever. Um, and they were not going out riding on their Peloton bikes. They were just sort of wandering around looking for their next meal or to be perfectly honest, trying to avoid being a next meal for another dinosaur. So, you have to look at um, the fossil record and remember, of course, another cliche of use it or lose it, that the musculoskeletal system, bone and muscle, is very responsive to mechanical challenges. And that works both to our benefit, remember saying the fossil record or to remaining healthy, but also there are consequences to it. I'll give you sort of a, a, an easily uh, reachable explanation or example of that. And that is you think of bed rest or cast immobilization. These are things if you put a cast on a distal radius fracture on a forearm fracture, your bone begins to basically resorb away very, very quickly because you're no longer stressing the bone. Um, you lay up in bed because you're ill or maybe you were in a motorcycle accident or something, your entire skeleton, short of your cranium, your head, begins to resorb away and dump calcium into your urine and you excrete it really at higher levels within 24 hours or so. So without mechanical demand, your bone, it's not diseased or poisoned, it's just responding to the absence of mechanical signals by resorbing away. And a great example of that, taking it you know, into the future, is we're all talking about starting human colonies on the moon or on Mars or whatever. And one of the biggest problems of thinking of an astronaut taking a nine month voyage to Mars is that they dump bone very, very rapidly, astronauts in space. It's one of the biggest problems that the European Space Agency or that NASA faces 
is how to actually keep the skeleton intact. Because it's one thing, if you break your femoral neck, your femur neck um, on the way to the grocery store, but if you're six months out into space and you break your femur, you can't exactly go to the orthopedic surgeon down the block. So in the world of osteoporosis, in, uh, which is probably the reason they listen to you, is they're interested in what sort of exercise regimens can protect their skeleton. And that's primarily because both men and women, they peak their bone mass and really their bone quality around the age of 35. And every decade after that, both men and women are losing about 3% of their bone density. Now it turns out that women following the menopause actually start losing bone at two to 3% per year. So it's much faster than men. So there's a rapid decline uh, during the menopausal years, three to eight years past the menopause where women are losing bone quite rapidly. And even though osteoporosis haunts both men and women, there's age-induced osteoporosis and there's menopausal or postmenopausal induced osteoporosis, type one and type two osteoporosis, that the reason that women suffer more, suffer more fractures than men because of osteoporosis is because A, at the age of 35, they start with less bone before they begin this decline. Two, because they have this rapid decline past the menopause, so they're at this sort of threshold where they're at greater risk of osteoporosis uh, fractures. And you know, the reality is, is that women live longer than men. And so they're carrying this risk of fracture for a much longer period than men. So um, for sake of argument, let's say that uh, of all the fracture risk, 80% of it is borne by women. But anyway, back to the astronaut. So if you have two to 3% loss of bone per decade after the age of 35 for men and women, and two to 3% loss of bone per year for women following the menopause, astronauts are losing two to 3% of bone per month. Just exceedingly fast loss of bone. And they're up there with perfect nutrition. Maybe they're not exactly getting the sunlight or the vitamin D exposure they were getting on earth, but let's be honest, what they're really missing is gravity. They don't have the pull of gravity. Their skeleton isn't challenged the same way. So on one side of the equation, the consequences of, of uh, the skeleton being responsive to loading is you take away load, you take away this mechanical challenge and bone will dump, uh, you'll resorb away quite quickly. The positive side of the equation is if you make mechanical demands on your skeleton, your bone will adapt and become stronger. The best example that I know of is in professional tennis players. They have about 30 to 35% more bone in their humerus, the upper arm, uh, the, the bone in the upper arm in their playing arm than the arm that simply throws the ball into the air. So, so that's showing that there is a local adaptation of bone to mechanical signals that is not systemic. It's not enjoyed throughout the entire skeleton, but only those regions that are sort of resisting the mechanical challenge. So if you could go out and play tennis against Venus Williams every day, uh, chances are you will build up not only your lower appendicular skeleton, your leg bones by running around, uh, and chasing down balls, but the arm that's swinging the racket will actually have quite a robust adaptation to the me mechanical challenge. So a long answer to your short question is that the fossil record will show or will reflect the mechanical challenges made on that dinosaur or on that, maybe that tribe of uh, Native Americans from New Mexico uh, will show the difference between hunters and gatherers. And so we know from sort of social anthropology 
the, the skeletal record tells us something about our past. The fossil record tells us something about dinosaurs or about seals or, or whatever. And I think that in modern medicine, even though we want to take a drug to stop a disease, we look for this magic bullet. And one of the best treatments or drugs you can take to slow down bone loss is exercise. So eat right, choose your parents carefully, get a little bit of sunlight every day and exercise. Okay, you mentioned bone mass, bone quality. Would you mind abbreviating in your answer the difference between the two of those? Sure. I can give that a try. So you have a bone density, how much bone usually uh, women sort of perimenopausal women or postmenopausal women will often go have a test of their bone density with DEXA or DEXA or DXA. It's dual energy X-ray absorbed geometry. And what that does is it sends two wavelengths of radiation through your bone, through your hip or through your wrist. And if you have high bone density, less radiation gets to the let's say the film that picks up that radiation dose. So the higher density you have, the higher bone density you will be evaluated with, often known as a T-score. So if you go have a DEXA, your uh, endocrinologist or your gerontologist or, or your general practitioner will read you a T-score. And that is an index of your bone density. Well, of all things, people that are bigger have higher bone density than people that are smaller. So T-score is an average score for that age of where you might land. Mm -hmm. Ironically, if you are petite, you are quite small, your average is most likely going to be below a, a T-score for a person of average weight and uh, body mass index. So density is one index of uh, bone's ability to resist fracture. The other is bone quality, and that is how well your bone is put together. And so you may have high bone density, but if it's not tied together very well, it's again at risk of fracture. It's this sort of synthesis of having enough and putting it together well enough. So if you're building a brick house, you want to make sure that the bricks are tied together at some point, often with metal rods uh, that are reinforcing the bricks behind the wall. So in the case of bone, there are two types of bone. There's dense cortical bone, like in the mid shaft of your femur or your tibia, your, your uh, shin bone. And then towards the ends of the bone, the, where the joints meet, that's where there is trabecular bone. There's also trabecular bone in your spine, your vertebrae are comprised of certainly cortical bone around enveloping the trabecular bone struts. And think of them like bridges, right? Because your bone marrow is enjoying living inside bone, but towards the end, it's interrupted by these uh, sort of struts or scaffolds or bridges of bone. So the surface to volume ratio of a trabeculae, a small strut of bone, is quite high compared to dense cortical bone. And so as it turns out, as you age and your bone begins to resorb away, some of the bone most vulnerable to resorption or age or endocrine imbalance um, induced uh, osteoporosis the bone that goes first are, is the bone towards the ends of your bone or the trabecular bone within your vertebrae. And therefore, your vertebrae is not as strong when you are 70 years old as it was when you were 75, uh, 35 years old. So your vertebrae can begin to collapse, just like a femoral neck fracture is often caused because the trabeculae that helps support your femoral head or the, the ball that goes into your pelvic socket, the trabecular bone is not really as robust as it used to be. 
And so even though you may have dense cortical bone, high bone density, your bone quality sort of is one of the first things to go with age. And there are very poor assays for that. Right. I was going to ask. Um, so I have many um, uh, clients, participants of my classes that uh, have never fractured and have a, you know, a, a low, low bone mineral density, you know, that's, they come back with these scores. Um, as ever, I always um, take the whole person and look at their core stability and everything. But I'm, you know, interested to understand how can I know about their bone quality? What, what, what tests? Well, there, there are formal ways to look at bone quality. Um, they're expensive. And in the United States, they're not necessarily reimbursed by insurance. So they're often done uh, in uh, research projects. And that's using uh, what's called spiral CT or PQCT. So it's a higher radiation dose. It's not something you would want to do um, that often, but it has the resolution that it can look at these struts of bone very, very carefully. And if you imagine driving over a, a bridge and the piers that hold up the bridge are in good shape, but the struts are beginning to corrode away from one span to the next, you start to worry when trucks go over it, it's not the piers that will collapse, but the roadway itself because the struts are no longer there. So PQCT can give you a sense of that bridging, but I would, back to your um, issue of some of your uh, clients and subjects have poor T-scores but have never fractured. A, um, I would wonder if they tend to be um, lighter or uh, smaller than, than others. But the other suggestion I make to people is just because you have a low T-score, don't panic. Just if you have no symptoms, certainly stay attuned to it, but have another DEXA test a year or two later, because in reality, at least from my perspective, and I'm sure I'll get lots of nasty emails from some of my clinical colleagues for saying this, but it's the rate of loss of bone that is the good index of whether you should worry. Because if you are Pete, petite, asymptomatic with a T-score of minus 1.5, but it's 1 1.5, minus 1 1.5 a year later, and five years later, and 10 years later, then chances are for your weight average T-score, you're actually probably pretty good. Because remember where that T-score comes from. Yeah. It's the average for that age that makes no correction for weight or size. So yeah. You know, it's something I think people in the osteoporosis, particularly the osteoporosis diagnosis uh, community is really struggling with, is that DEXA is a great first order approximation of your bone density, but it's not a particularly great index of risk of fracture, just as you point out. So if you have a T-score of minus four, you need to work with your family and your physician and explore all avenues to make sure you don't lose any more and perhaps consider ways of gaining some bone density and bone quality. But if you have a T-score of minus one or minus 1 1.5, which isn't even in the WHO, right, the World Health Organization uh, index of osteoporosis, it's osteopenia, right? It's bone wasting. It's not symptomatic bone fracture that you might explore uh, pharmaceutical treatments or changing your exercise regime, taking one of your classes, um, something to try to maintain the bone that you have. So, so leads me on to my next question. It's quite exercise related. Um, are there borderline recommendations for natural weight bearing at different points throughout life? So, ch I, I mean, the, the general advice I hear with children is and, and teenagers is just get on your feet, do as much variety, variety for the bones as much as possible, you know, get them in the playground, get them doing all sorts with their arms and their legs. Um, also thinking about adolescents, young adults, older adults, frail adults, whether there's actual recommendations, because I know what we're going to discuss today when we get to it, the vibration therapy 
will have certain frequencies and um, amplitudes involved in them. Um, but is there, an is, is there an ideal for people to bear weight a certain amount, a certain frequency, a certain way, a certain intensity throughout their day, week, in order to maintain strong, healthy bones? Well, well we, could, we could talk about that question for uh, eight hours, easily. So you must be about a two minute. <laughs> That first, thing to, first thing to remember is uh, what we were just talking about a few minutes ago, which was peaking your bone mass at the age of 35, and then sort of, sort of trying to figure out ways to slow that decline. So the idea of young adolescents, teenagers, kids, uh, young adults going out and exercising as much as they want, or as much as they can, or as much as they're sort of provoked to do, is a great strategy because that's putting bone in the bank, right? So then when you're at 35 and perhaps are not as active, you're no longer playing tennis against Venus Williams, that you're, yes, you're losing bone pretty much at the same rate as everybody else, but you've started with more. So yeah, kids are more excited by exercise. They like recess in school. They like playing soccer or football with, the, with their buddies or, or tennis or squash or whatever. So yeah, you wanna take advantage of that to build up bone while you can. And certainly uh, as you age, and particularly in groups of the frail elderly, you don't wanna go out and play tennis against uh, Rafi Nadal or, or Venus Williams because chances are you're going to provoke the very fracture you intended to avoid. So you have to sort of prescribe exercise reg regimens that are consistent with your age group, your activity level, and your capability. Mm -hmm. I will add that bone itself is part of the culprit in this because bone becomes less responsive to mechanical signals as we age. And I personally, although there are lots of people who might disagree with me, I personally believe that, that the marrow itself, which we mentioned earlier, is largely responsible for that. So within your bone marrow, right, that sort of fatty stuff you might see in a nice fresh French restaurant when you're served, um, uh, well, we won't get into cuisine here, but I'm sure everyone knows what bone marrow is, that within this bone marrow are its stem cells. And there are two types of stem cells in your bone marrow. There are mesenchymal stem cells, MSCs, which when they differentiate or they decide what to do when they grow up as adult stem cells, they can either become bone or muscle if they're satellite cells or ligament or tendon. They can also become fat. The other type of stem cell in your bone marrow are hematopoietic stem cells, which grow up to be your immune system, your T and B cells, but also your macrophages and your macrophages in bone we worry about osteoclast or bone eating cells. Problem is, as we age, or at, when we're young and running around the playground, you know, 10 years old or 15 years old or whatever, that uh, what, uh, what your uh, bone marrow is very enriched with stem cells and they can be very responsive to mechanical signals. They're easily recruited, there are lots of them, and it's sort of the old parable of if a kid breaks his wrist at a playground, by the time they've reached the uh, emergency room in an ambulance, their bones have started to heal. It's very different in adults and particularly aging adults that their marrow has begun to turn to fat. And that fat does a number of things. One, it's pushing all the stem cells out of that space. So there are far fewer of them. But also being in a fatty environment, the stem cells that are there tend to head towards pernicious or not uh, um, particularly beneficial endpoints. Remember the MSC, the mesenchymal stem cell, can grow up to become bone. So it can become a bone cell, an osteoblast, a bone forming cell, but it can also become an adipocyte, a fat cell and form fat. And this is one of the funny correlations when you peak at the age of 35 and your bone is beginning to decline, what do we all worry about of course, is increasing fat. 
subcutaneous fat, fat within our visceral cavities and around our major organ systems, that we think that one of the benefits of exercise is not only driving these stem cells to become bone and muscle and ligament and tendon, what aren't they doing by stimulating them with exercise is they aren't becoming fat. So we tend to think, and I know we're focused on osteoporosis here and exercise strategies to build bone, but what's happening is your exercise strategies are driving this stem cell pool to become bone. What they're not doing is they're not becoming fat. So Can I interject? Um, would, would, would we say now, I'm just picking the person that does do their exercise. They, they do exercise every single day. They wake up, they have their breakfast. They have a fairly, uh, you know, just a really moderate lifestyle. You know, they eat well, they do their exercise. Then they have a day of mainly sitting. And then into the evening, they couch, you know, sofa. You know, yeah. Couch potato, yeah. Now, does that make a difference? This whole, this sitting is killing us sort of thing, this, this link to sedentary lifestyle. Does it make a difference doing your big fat workout at the beginning of the day and then doing hardly anything the rest of the day to the bones or to doing a little bit and then not a lot, a little bit of exercise, not a lot, a little bit. Does this make a difference, the frequency? So, so um, I'm going to give you a non-answer to that. And that is that my advice to anyone that will listen to me is to make sure you incorporate exercise of any type, walking around the block or running a marathon every day at least once a day. Because these adaptations in bone happen first. Remember, we started our conversation by talking about in vitro experiments, experiments on cells and incubators. And you expose these cells to mechanical signals, which are one of the wacky things we do in our lab. We exercise cells, as it were. So what you see is these cells actually change their architecture. They change their cell quality, just like bone quality, cell quality. And these cytoskeletal elements that create structure within a cell, they adapt very quickly to a mechanical challenge. But most importantly in that message, before I convince all of your listeners to become cell biologists, the most important message there is that these adaptive changes in the architecture of a cell are transient. Within 24 hours, those cells go back to being your couch potato. So if you don't stimulate your cells or your bone or your body once per day, it tends to start this decline. Not that it's not that your body thinks it's doing a bad thing. It's adapting to the challenges you provide. And remember, modern civilization hasn't been around really all that long when you get right down to it, right? I mean, you know, a uh, hundred years or so, right? Before we were all out working, before we were driving around in our cars, we were out, you know, working in the fields or working in industry or hunting animals. Our skeletons are, we as organisms have not adapted to being in a highly technical society where we don't actually have to work all the time. So your body is, because it's expensive to build up bone and muscle, it's most efficient thing is to take calories and do what with them? Store them as fat so that when we can't find food, we have fat stores so we can live to hunt another day. Well, that physiologic system still persists in us so that if we are sitting around all day, those Oreo cookies or those barbecued ribs or that yogurt that we're eating, we're not driving it, we're not burning it. And so your body says, aha, I'm gonna store it as fat so I can use it later. So without prescribing a perfect exercise regime for your listeners who might be young and 20 years old, looking forward to their, uh, their French open tennis match mm. or the frail elderly who are just eager to get out and walk around the block, do it every day, not three days a week, not two days a week, not once a week, but every day. So figure out what you're most comfortable with, walking around the block with friends or playing golf with your buddies 
or riding in the Tour de France where they're eating 10 to 12,000 calories per day and there's not an ounce of fat on any of them, it's because yes, they are burning fat, but they're also driving their stem cells to become muscle and bone. Okay, so no comment about the fact that um, we, we are active on a certain time of our day and then we move into being sedentary. There's no link to anything, doing anything uh, negative to the bone throughout. Again, it, for, for people who are asking me for schedules, which I guess you're sort of nudging me to do, I would say that if it's going to help you integrate it into your daily life, figure out when it's best for you. There is research coming from uh, my people studying uh, metabolomics, et cetera, or metabolism that are convinced that exercise later in the day somehow mobilizes fat stores better. But these are people that, again, on me being on the fringe of this discussion, are convinced that factors that contribute to obesity are primarily metabolic. So are you burning as many calories as you take in? Because if you aren't burning all those Oreo cookies, they're going to convert to fat, right? My argument is that there's a mechanical element to that, that if you're signaling cells to adapt, that there's a parallel mechanism that's important in the fight against obesity that's not simply exercise burning the fat, but mechanical stimulation of cells. It sounds similar, it's actually very, very different in its nature. I would say the work that we've been doing with mechanical signals and cells, and in my case, has been for over 40 years, um, what we found is that more is not necessarily better, that if you exercise for 10 minutes a day, the benefits that you see for your musculoskeletal system aren't necessarily improved tenfold if you then exercise for 100 minutes per day. Bone is, is, and I've used this metaphor before, is like a light switch, that if you can figure out how to turn on that light switch, it doesn't take long to do that. Mm -hmm. It could take longer in the elderly group because you have to mobilize these stem cells that have been sort of encroached out because of fat. But once you find that signal, doing it for two hours doesn't give you additional benefit over what you might see for, for 10 minutes. So again, and, and the other odd thing, which maybe we'll talk about later, is that this transient nature of adaptations in cells, that light switch that you cause the cell to actually create these architectural changes and make it even more sensitive to mechanical signals, there's a trick that we do in our lab to get our cells to be even more responsive. And that was actually discovered by my sister of all people, who's an endocrinologist down at University of North Carolina, that if you exercise your cells very briefly, and even with really small signals, and you stimulate this adaptive change in the cellular architecture, if you wait about three hours and you tickle them or you exercise them again, they become even more responsive. So it ratches up the mechanosensitivity of your skeleton. So if I were to prescribe an exercise regimen for those listening to us, I wouldn't say do it in the morning or do it in the afternoon. I would say do a little bit in the morning, wait three hours, and then do a little bit in the afternoon. So you can really sort of cheat the system. It's really interesting actually, because I have, I have um, many participants that will um, bookend my sessions with walks, you know, either a walk before or a walk after. And um, so that's really interesting advice that it might be an idea to maybe follow it on with a meal and then, and then maybe a, a walk. Yeah. A little bit later. Watch your favorite TV show and then go yeah. out walk yeah. around the block again. Exactly, yes. exactly. So let's segue on to vibration therapy. Yes. Uh, I'm interested in the historical timeline, how mechanical stimuli has been realized to have a therapeutic effect. Um, where does it start and how have you and your fellow scientists arrived at where you are today with regards to vibration therapy and evidence-based claims? Well, to, right, so, so exercise in bone is, is um, I mean, that was basically first identified 
or which is known in, in the bone world as Wolf's Law of Form and Function in the Skeleton uh, about 150 years ago. So um, please, nobody think that I am sort of pioneering mechanical signals in bone, but, but the challenge has been to try to figure out what mechanical signals cause what. And just like driving too heavy a truck over a bridge, you can make too large a mechanical demand on your skeleton and actually cause exactly the fracture you're, you're trying to prevent. So um, I think everyone is comfortable with the idea and probably many people listening to this are exercising while they're doing it, is exercise is good for you, right? This isn't a modern discovery, but it's been around for eons. Um, and I think that that comes from basically modern life modern life being three billion years of life. There's been one constant since the beginning of, of life of biology, and that it's not light because it gets dark at night, and it's not complex drugs because modern man created those. Um, it's not temperature because it changes all over the world. Um, it's gravity. So all cells in your body, all single cells for that matter, respond to mechanical signals. So it shouldn't be a surprise to anyone that exercise causes these adaptations in us, in humans. And for that matter, think of it the other way. Think of it as exercise as being the normal and being a couch potato watching TV all day is actually the aberrant entity. So it's taking away mechanical signals is causing these diseases don't think of exercise as a way of treating disease, but taking away exercise as causing disease, obesity, osteoporosis, decline in cognitive function, it's because mechanical signals are good for you. So how did I end up here? I started actually in England when I was a graduate student working with my thesis advisor, Lance Lanyon, that we started looking at what's the minimal amount of mechanical signal you can put into a system to cause it to stay, to hold, mm. not to stimulate growth, but to inhibit resorption. Because let's be honest, if you're 35 and you've peaked your bone mass, what you really want to do is you want to make sure that your skeleton outlives you. So if you can live to be 90, just make sure that the rate of bone loss is slow enough that your skeleton is quite happy when you pass away, right? So we started looking at what's the minimal amount of mechanical signal you could put into a system to stop resorption from happening. And we worked on roosters and turkeys and lots of different things. Um, and what we found is that strain was basically the driving feature in this. If you take a, a rubber band, an elastic, I guess you call it there, and you stretch it, by adding a force, a tensile force to this rubber band, you're causing it to distend, to elongate, to strain. Same thing happens with your bone. When you apply a load to it, when you stand up, you're applying a load to your femoral neck and your bone strains. So when you apply a load to your skeleton, your bone tissue strains. It deformed very, very slightly, about 0.1% strain. Really, really, really small. And we'd use gauges to, to, to monitor this. And what we found is that when you walk down the street, your tibia sees about a thousand microstrain, more units than you care to, to go to, but 0.1% strain. When you run, it's around 2000 microstrain. So how much running do you require to maintain your bone? Well, we figured, well, let's start with an hour of 2,000 microstrain. And that maintained and actually stimulated bone to grow. So let's try 1,000 microstrain, walking strain for an hour that maintained bone. Great. Let's try 10 minutes. That kept it. Let's try four seconds of 1,000 micro, four cycles of loading per day was enough to maintain your bone at a fairly high strain, a fairly high load. So you could play all sorts of tricks, infinite tricks with how much load, how many cycles, how many cycles per day, 
how many days per week, all these iterations. But what I wanted to do is I wanted to figure out how much to actually grow bone with how little strain. So I would reduce the amount of strain from 1,000 microstrain to 100 microstrain to 10 microstrain. Just keep cutting it into the noise of the system. Mm. What we found is if you had this exchange between number of cycles and strain magnitude that you could still get bone to stay in one piece without reserving away. So rather than 30 cycles of a high strain, you could do it with 30,000 cycles of an exceedingly small strain. Okay. Somehow sending these signals to the bone cells to avoid resorption. The problem with 30,000 cycles is if you do it one cycle per second, taking 30,000 seconds, it's a long time. So we just what do you do? You increase the frequency, right? You do it rather than one cycle per second. You do it quite quickly. You do it 10 cycles per second or 30 cycles per second called 30 hertz. And we found that not only did 30 cycles per second at a very low strain magnitude maintain bone, it caused bone to grow. So even though these signals are much, much lower than the signals that you're tibia might see you when walking, that if you increase the frequency, it would be anabolic or simulate bone to grow, which was fascinating because when you think about it, everything that we do in sensing our external environment is done by frequency, right? The way you see colors in the electromagnetic spectrum Blue is a different wavelength than orange. The way you hear me change my voice. That's a change in frequency and in tone. The way your pressure corpuscles feel the texture of a blouse or a shirt. It, you can't feel texture until you move your fingers. That's because your corpuscles are very sensitive to 100 hertz signals. Why not bone? Well, Okay, let's say that you and your listeners agree. Okay, Clint, this is fine. 30 cycles per second stimulates bone. But what conceivable physiologic relevance does 30 hertz have? It makes no sense because Usain Bolt runs a 100-yard dash at two and a half hertz, not 30 hertz. Mm. So it turns out that of all things, muscle, when it contracts, Muscle is a very inefficient motor. And when it contracts, it actually oscillates, it vibrates. You're holding up your beer mug or your coffee cup, or you're silly enough to lift barbells, your muscles are actually vibrating to pull. And where do they vibrate? Between 20 to 50 hertz cycles per second. So all of a sudden we were seeing that when you're standing around in line to go to the movies or when you're running, the predominant signal, mechanical signal your bones see is not running to the bus. It's standing around in the grocery store, but your bones are being bombarded with these muscle contraction signals because they're contracting to hold you upright and they're sending these mechanical signals to your bone. Really, really small, yeah. but they're always there. Yeah. So we decided that, because we knew that lots and lots of signals at very, very small strain magnitudes would stimulate bone to grow, but we didn't have enough time in the day to do it. So we increased frequency and found, wow, bone's even more responsive, but it made, made no physiologic sense. And then we thought about it and said, aha, muscle contracts in this realm. Maybe we are a, by putting people on these vibrating plates at very, very, very small magnitudes, intensities, we're providing a surrogate for exercise. And we're tricking the bone into thinking that it's being exercised. In no way am I trying to pretend that I am 
figured out mother nature or our lab work has done that. It's just that if you are bedridden, if you are somebody being treated for cancer with radiotherapy or chemotherapy and you can't go out and play tennis against Venus Williams, that this is a way of putting mechanical signals into the skeleton and through a number of cell and animal and now human trials, we have shown that the bone can be very responsive to these signals. And just so I don't forget two points. One, going back to if some is good, more must be better. Just because your doctor tells you to take one pill to treat this, uh, um, your headache, doesn't mean that you take 40 aspirin to treat it even better, right? You take one aspirin. Just because a little bit of vibration is good doesn't mean that a lot of vibration is better. Mm. Vibration is a really nasty pathogen. Causes everything from low back pain and helicopter pilots and, and truck drivers to percussive injuries and loss of hearing, um, white finger disease and people that use handheld machinery, et cetera. So before everyone jumps on these machines that generate high magnitude, high intensity, whole body vibration, just be aware that these are exceedingly dangerous, not demonstrated by me, but the International Standards Organization is telling you, stay away from these devices, particularly if you have low bone density, think of your poor femoral neck and that truck driving over it. And all of a sudden, you know, you're walking down the street at 1.2 G, your impact uh, fighting G, Earth's gravitational field. Now you're standing on this device that's generating 8 G. It potentiates fractures and damage to your cartilage, damage to your bone, damage to your major organ systems. So point A, avoid whole, whole body high magnitude vibration. People hate me the world over for saying that, and I will say it till the day I die stay away from it. There's no evidence that I know of that where the benefits outweigh the potential risks. The second thing is, and my naysayers will point this out as well, is that my goal in my lab is to see my work translate to be new strategies to treat disease. And something I wake up happy about every day and I'm exceedingly proud about and the only way you can do that is to bring it to the commercial sector. So we have these patents, or as you say, these patents, that we protect our intellectual property, our inventions. And then companies go and they license these. And so there are companies that make these devices for us. I'm a founder of companies, both for cell therapies and for treatment of, of uh, human diseases. Um, and I say this with great pride but I also re remind your listeners that I say it with a duly noted conflict of interest um, because although I've yet to benefit from them, lo and behold, don't tell my wife, um, but that it's something that uh, I take great joy in doing every day. So I wanna talk a little bit about the companies and organizations making and marketing these machines, the ones that are supported by your evidence. Um, is the machine the uh, kind of the order of play? Is the machine designed by a scientist like yourself, and then there's a blueprint which is handed over um, for production, or does a company design the machine based on the evidence? Because there are so many different makes and models out there, so I'm trying to understand yeah. the order. And then, uh, so based on the evidence, intensity recommendations, and then the machine goes through lab testing. Or what? What's the order? And um, you know, it's calc. Mat engineering calculations, research, testing, design, production. How, how, does, how does it work? Right, so, so I can't speak for other companies or technologies. Yeah. I can certainly tell you what yeah. I think. Yeah. Um, but all of the things that we bring to the point of um, providing an intervention or a non-drug strategy, complementary th strategy uh, to try to fight uh, things like osteoporosis or obesity, et cetera, et cetera, it all goes through these stages we've been talking about for the past hour. The cell stuff, the animal stuff, the human trials. And we've done, we've done human trials and everything from kids in remission of cancer, kids with CP, kids with Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, up through the frail elderly. And 
you know, before, um, for example, let, let's talk just for a second about what we did before we stuck kids, we started a trial on kids in, in remission for cancer. And, um, actually the physicians driving the study found it so safe that we're actually now doing a study on kids with active leukemias. Because if I'm going to convince you that it is an anabolic or a stimulus to bone, what you don't want to do is go in to a group of people that have active cancers and feed the beast, as it were. So we did a number of trials on um, mice highly susceptible to ovarian cancer. And we subjected them to the slow intensity vibrations, very specific signal for a year to look at what's called the longevity function to see if mice that are being buzzed on the plate would die more quickly or be more prone to tumors than the mice, same strain of mice, but the, in the control group. And what we found is there was no evidence whatsoever of any elevation of, of um, uh, loss of life in these mice subject uh, susceptible to ovarian cancer. But not only did we protect their bone better, there's more trabecular and cortical bone in the spine and in the legs of these mice, but of all things, we saw fewer tumor numbers. And this goes back to mechanical signals are important to lots of systems. So then what the group uh, treating um, kids in remission wanted to see is what about kids with active cancers? So we took a mouse model and we gave them a cancer called myeloma, basically a blood cancer, to show that if you actually had cancer and you stood on this plate, what would happen? And what we showed, and this is with a graduate student at the time, Gabe Pagnotti, what we were able to show so the mice not only had better bone, trabecular bone and cortical bone, and less porosity in the bone, which is basically a real um, downstream, downstream consequence of myeloma is higher porosity in bone. We showed less tumor in the marrow, less tumor necrosis in the marrow, so less advanced tumor, and basically healthier animals. So again, not that this is a magic bullet, but your, um, in the oncology world, people will tell you exercise to reduce susceptibility to cancer. And if you have cancer, exercise if you can. And we just published a paper that actually shows the cell mechanism for that. But anyway, long story, uh, the people at St. Jude's uh, in a study run by Kiri Ness uh, at St. Jude's took these kids and put them on the <laughs> on the buzzing plate designed by us. We didn't give the plates to them and say, well, you know, dial in whatever you want. This is what we found in mice to be effective. This is what we hypothesize will be effective in kids, right? And this goes back to their goal of not treating cancer with vibration, wouldn't that be nice, but rather going back to the premise that you got to build up bone while you can before you reach the age of 35 and here are these kids being treated for cancer that can't go out and exercise and build up the bank of bone. So in, in their study, published in Lancet Oncology, I believe, about two years ago, showed that these kids that stood on this device for a year had better bone than the kids who stood on a sham device or a placebo device. And the data were compelling enough that St. Jude's is currently running a study it's called a double blind placebo controlled prospective study. So we won't know the data until the day until the study is completed with kids with actual active leukemias to try to protect their bone while they are being treated for cancer. So again, when we do our studies, whether it's on old sheep, one of the first studies we did was published in a journal called Nature. And 20 years ago, exactly, we were trying to figure out what the signal would be that we would put postmenopausal women on. 
that we showed in these sheep that these signals did no harm and were anabolic to bone. We took exactly those same devices. We cleaned them up a little bit from the barnyard, but put a group of 64 postmenopausal women on these devices, half of which were placebo and half of which were active. And we showed that the placebo group over the course of year, remember, perimental and postmenopausal women losing 3% bone per year. What happened? They lost 3% of their bone over the course of that year. But the women on the active device maintained their bone. Was it, did it stimulate bone? No. Did it prevent bone loss? Yes. Is that exciting? Of course, because our goal is to prevent osteoporosis, which we did. And lots of studies in between young women with osteoporosis. I'm writing a paper right now on kids with Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, showing this intervention uh, can, can slow bone loss and actually stimulate bone gain. And these are very specific and prescribed signals that we define by our work in our cells, in our mice, in our turkeys, in our sheep, before they get to the women to show that they are safe and do no harm. So, so what, I, what I was trying to get at with the question was, is the, the machine itself, is the, um, it doesn't have adjustable um, frequencies and amplitudes. No. It's, it's no. that, that's the, the machine does, and that's, that's what the, com, com, the companies that you are painted with are, right. are marketing. So, so, whereas you know, whereas the, the frequency and amplitude that is within your evidence base, that, if, if I mean, there are just hundreds on the market. Thousands. I'm not saying, I'm, and I'm not, I have, I'm, I can't pinpoint any, any specifically, but what I'm trying to understand is, is there any other machine that has just one specific frequency and amplitude? Or I, I, maybe you don't know the answer to this, or are all the others just a variety of different amplitudes? The varieties, and, and unfortunately you call the manufacturers that, oh, just, Turn the knob till you find something you're happy with. Or just ask them, ask to see the scientific studies that defend it. I mean, it'd be like your physician saying, well, you have osteoporosis. Here's a bottle of estrogen. Just drink as much as you're comfortable with and everything will be fine and call me in the morning. You know, here's some bisphosphonates. Here's some Fosamax. Well, if you want to take 10 pills, sure, I don't care. Um, it's the same, it's exactly the same problem. And unfortunately, a lot of these vibration manufacturers refer people to our work. And I go back to the point that vibration is very, very dangerous. So, um, you know, we think we are in a nice, sweet spot. Is it a perfect signal? Probably not. But we show that we can recruit those stem cells from the bone marrow drive them to become bone and muscle. We can slow their differentiation into fat. We can take the hematopoietic stem cells and drive them towards becoming T and B cells, helping your immune system, slowing their differentiation into macrophages. We can show in long-term studies in mice that we can grow bone, slow tumor growth, lots of other things which we don't have time to get into before we get into the humans. I would say to your listeners before they go to Carrefour or Costco or Amazon and buy a device, ask the manufacturer for the science that supports it. We're not claiming to be an exercise device that's in a gym, stand on this device and you'll look like Arnold Schwarzenegger in three months. It's not what I do. So, so who, is, who is this device for? Because I know you and I have touched on this in discussion previously. Is this device for somebody that is doing exercise every day as an add-on? Is this device for somebody with um, uh, with osteopenia that wants to, you know, really um, kind of uh, bulk up their defense? Um, who Who is it for? So, so I would say that if you are a healthy young adult, you know, 30 years old, exercising every day, you know, not drinking too much, not smoking, you have good genes, good bones, et cetera, et cetera. You're doing all the right things. I would say that sending on this device is going to do absolutely nothing for you. I mean, I could be wrong, and clinical trials are so hard to do. 
that um, I would never even bother designing one to examine that question. What I believe, you know, I want to help people who are at risk of osteoporosis. I want to slow the incidence of fracture. I want to slow the loss of bone. And that's, you know, a, a problem in kids that can't be active because of disease or kids that have genetic disorders that mean they can't play at the playground, up to people who are um, being treated for other diseases and their bone loss is, is basically pouring away. We're starting a tri trial on, of all things on um, breast cancers now. Not that we're treating breast cancer, but women who are suffering from breast cancer are not only because of the disease, but because of the drugs are dumped bone quite rapidly, right? And these are women, the last thing in the world we're gonna do is take yet another drug to try to prevent bone loss. So is this a way to, without using drugs, protect the skeleton? So I would say those that have poor bone or losing bone quickly or are unable to exercise because of uh, parallel disorders, um, maybe because of injury or because of joint pain or back pain or something, that this is something in discussions with their physician and their family is a strategy to include as part of their armamentarium or in alone. Um, and I will remind you, and of course you know this, but perhaps your listeners don't, that probably of those in the osteopenia osteoporosis range, Half the women don't want to take drugs to prevent a disease. So there's half of them out the window right there. And those that are prescribed the drugs, half of them never even refill the prescription. Because who wants to take a drug for 20 years to prevent a disease? I mean, I'm with you. It's why I do what I do. Because I think that the body's responsiveness to external signals like mechanical signals, exercise, low intensity vibration, whatever, is so powerful that if we can figure out how to do it, it makes sense to do it. So you mentioned something before you said this or this, um, somebody with poor, uh, poor bone, uh, bone health or poor bone, um, or somebody that's unable to exercise. How about somebody with poor bone health that is able to exercise? Is this a good add-on? I'm trying. And what I'm trying to understand is whether they're fine with their, you know, all the exercise they're doing daily, or this is a really brilliant little top-up for them. Well, so so um, I'm going. I'm going to try to address that question two ways. First, most importantly, I don't know. Um, there's a study going on by Belinda Beck right now in Australia in Mel not Melbourne um, at Griffith University in collaboration with me using, what else, the devices that we design to study if high intensity exercise and low or low intensity vibration, are they the same? Or when combined, are they, are they better? Is there a synergy? Um, the study in order to get into um, women with breast cancer, we did a mouse study, which there are abstracts out, the paper is under review, that shows that low intensity vibration under breast cancer conditions with zolendronate, a typical anti-resorptive for breast cancer, zolendronate doesn't particularly stop bone loss in high incidence of breast cancer. Low intensity vibration does not stop the bone loss when fighting um, treatments for breast cancer, but together they actually do pretty well. So there is the potential for synergy. So I would say yes, but I would also say that if you're out exercising and you're at risk of osteoporosis, and let's say you're in a higher age group, you know, 70 or higher or something, remember that your marrow has been encroached by fat. So even though you are exercising, it's difficult to recruit those cells that will build bone. So I would say, exercise twice a day or exercise plus vibration or don't do one or the other. Yes, do them both. Keep lighting, keep lighting the switch. Keep, right. See, you're listening, right? Exactly right. Keep hitting that switch. 
trying to keep up, trying to keep up. Um, and, and an interesting one I've got for you because I, I and I'll, I'll link these two together. I do have um, uh, quite a few people that come to me with scoliosis. Um, so I'm, I'm very interested because I know I know that the recommendations for this device are to stand on the device. Don't put your hands on the device. Don't sit on the device. Um, that the the messages and the frequent the messages that are traveling up. Is there a potential, or do you know yet whether there's a potential for us you, a, a, miss, a miss kind of communication between the vertebra if there's such an extreme, extreme scoliosis or, an, or even an extreme, uh, you know, um, malalignment of, I mean, any, any bone really that's displaced yeah. slightly? So it's, it's an easy question to answer because we actually know the answer. Okay. Um, there, a group in Hong Kong run by K.S. Leung actually did a study on young women with scoliosis, idiopathic scoliosis, to see if this device could build up their bone and you know, taking all the things like spinal curvature into account. And lo and behold, I mean, I wouldn't be so excited about it if I didn't know the answer, but yes, this was anabolic. It didn't do anything to straighten the curvature did build up bone in the vertebrae of the scoliotic uh, young women. And this brings an important question back, uh, um, back to your uh, issue of those devices allow you to turn the dial this way and that way and choose whatever frequency or amplitude you want. Not only is amplitude potentially dangerous, but frequency is an important component of the equation. Remember, we try to fit right in the window of that muscle contractibility spectra. So muscle is contracting between 20 to 50 cycles per second. So we choose 30 Hertz. We're not giving you the option to change it to, oh, well, 30 is good, 60 must be better. It's important because one of the early studies we did in Sweden is we took something called Steinman pins, which are surgical pins, and we put them into the spines of people, of volunteers, and into the pelvis of a trochanter of volunteers. And we put these little sensors called accelerometers on them. And we stood them on the device in the OR, in the operating theater. And what we found is what's called the transmissibility function. Horrible word, but it's how much mechanical information is delivered to the bottom of your foot transmits up to the femur through the spine to your head. And it turns out that it's very dependent on, of all things, frequency. So up to around 30 cycles per second, the transmissibility function, the efficiency of bringing that mechanical signal up to your hip and spine is quite high. It's about 80%. So a very small signal delivered to the bottom of your foot does reach your hip and spine. Above 30 hertz, by 35 hertz, 38 hertz, very small changes of that dial, it drops off significantly from 80% to about 50%. So there are devices out there, and actually one of the reasons I divorced myself from one of the early companies, Juvent, is a company I founded and was very proud of, is they made it easier to build the device by changing the frequency up to 38 hertz, 38 cycles per second, because it displaces much less than at 30 hertz. The problem is, is that A, we have not done any clinical trials at 38 hertz, so I can't support that. And B, very little of the signal actually reaches the regions of interest. So why would you do it in the first place? So when I fought them about it, they said, no, 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 we're gonna do this because it's easier to do and because um, uh, it's cheaper to, to build. So I walked away and started a new company called Meridine that is far more consistent with the signals we use in the clinic because if I'm going to talk to you and your listeners are going to listen to me about the clinical trials, the evidence of what we do in the lab of working in the clinic, I'm not talking about all forms of vibration. I'm only talking about the vibration that we study.
low intensity vibration. Um, we've been focused on the lower limb and the, the spine. Um, anything in the pipeline to look at this device impacting the um, rib cage, the distal forearm, major fracture sites that you know we, we're not really discussing? It's a great question. And, and unfortunately, I'm, I'm going to um, throw a curveball back at you. Remember I, I said earlier that uh, we were doing the study in kids with Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. And we argue- Mike, just for my viewers, what is Duchenne's muscular dystrophy? It's a, it's a form of muscular dystrophy that haunts only uh, male children. Um, it's unfortunately a terminal disease where basically the muscle can't contract in the same way. And really by teenagers, uh, these kids can be confined to a wheelchair. It's an awful, horrible disease of which uh, there is no cure for. Um, and eventually um, the diaphragm, which is a muscle, can no longer contract so that the kids can't breathe. Um, and so along the way, of course, because for a number of reasons, uh, their bone begins to decline, they're at risk of fracture, um, they're held up in wheelchairs, et cetera. So when they stand up, uh, they're at greater risk of injury. Um, so we did a study on ambulatory or on kids that were still able to walk uh, uh, to see if we could build up their bone while they were still active. Um, and the nature of the signal is that by standing on the device, it transmits, transversibility function, up through the femur into the spine, the real regions of uh, uh, risk, certainly if you fall on your wrist, uh, it's an uh, important um, thing to keep in mind with osteoporosis, but we only treat the weight-bearing skeleton, not the non-weight-bearing skeleton. And the trick is that we are doing our analysis based on each young man's wrist as their internal control, because it doesn't see the signal. I will point out though, as you well know, that many of your people are afraid of falling as an incident that causes the fracture, right? That you're, you lose your balance or you're less steady on your feet. Remember, I've talked a lot about bone, but I can also talk about muscle, that we show that these signals are also anabolic to muscle as well. And we can show that in people confined to bed, and this is a study funded by NASA, where we had volunteers confined to bed for 90 days without being able to get up as a model for space flight of all things, that these people confined to bed rest would be buzzed each day compared to their non-buzz controls by this sling system we were going to use in the space station for astronauts. And what we showed is that Remember in our trip to Mars earlier in this discussion, when they get to Mars after nine months of non-weight bearing, their skeleton and their musculoskeletal system is in great decline. Not only they're at high risk of fracture, they're at high risk of falling over because they're very unstable on their feet. Imagine poor bone quality, poor balance system, poor muscle strength, falling over, those are the risk factors for fracture. It's not just bone density and bone quality, it's muscle strength and balance. Which is the case for false prevention exercises. and Right, and so we have studied balance with our buzzing plate and shown that we can stop and slow loss of balance decline by standing on the, on the plate. Um, something else that's come up for me on my research is um, targeted vibration and that's, I, you know, for people that don't know, I mean, what it looks like when you Google it is a gun, you know, and they place it on the bone and, and target it. Is that something that might be in the pipeline with your work to look at? I'm, I'm really interested in this, you know, the rib cage and the, the distal forearm thing, because many of my um, clients and participants are active older adults. They're in transition. They're not um uh, you know frail um just yet or whatever your de um let's just use a, a commercial definition of frailty just for argument's sake but they 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 do have the reaction to stretch their arms out and 
to, if they do slip, trip or fall, that would be the most vulnerable part. And so that's why I'm interested in your thoughts and feelings about targeted vibration and whether there's anything in the pipeline. With right. You. So, so um, I can't directly answer the question. Being an academic means I can indirectly answer it because okay. I try to answer everything being academics. Um, one of the early users of vibration technology in medicine was of all, of all things, a pediatric surgeon who was worried about congestive disorder of neonates. So in the pediatric ICU, little kids laid up in bed for whatever reason would generate congestion in lungs and they weren't actually getting a lot of air in the lungs. So we thought of mobilizing mucus in the lungs using targeted vibration, one of these guns, uh, there's a horrible word, one of the yeah. uh, it, vibrating devices yeah. uh, pushed against the sternum. Yeah. And whatever we found with the congestion, we found oddly enough that there was a buildup of density of bones and cartilage, uh, in particular neonates is primarily cartilage, but he saw denser cartilage there. So yeah, I, I certainly wouldn't argue against it. And people send me all sorts of wild devices from, you know, uh, I could show you probably about 20 of them around here. Oh, vibration, you know, it's like, what's nothing bad about vibration from lots of different circumstances. You can use your imagination, um, but uh, I think it has potential, but I will also say that um, one of the hardest things I've done in my scientific career is actually to do clinical trials. It's hard to recruit, it's hard to keep compliance up. It's, you know, there's lots of uh, variation between this person and that person, what they eat, what they do during the day. Um, so I try to make sure the clinical trials we do are asking questions that we really can answer. So to do a study on targeted vibration sounds really interesting, but it's probably not a study that I will do. Maybe one of your listeners will come up with a 30 hertz 0.4 G signal that, that's applied. Um, I do know that in the orthodontia on the teeth scraping world, they now have devices that vibrate at exactly our signal uh, constraints mm -hmm. of the infinite parameters they could come up with, they came up with the parameters we use and called it a new invention. But the thing is then the, the, the dissipation of the vibration hasn't occurred through the spine and actually it's, it's in the skull already. So like, do we know? And I mean, the other thing is targeted vibration. I'm imagining there's so many different angles you can target these. Yeah, for sure. It's, it's, it's just so, I mean, there's so many different parameters, aren't there? And I think that's just it. I want to do a really quick little cute, you know, um, bullet point for you. And I know <laughs> I, I'm, what I'm noticing a weakness of yours, Professor Rubin, is answering questions very quickly. But this one you're going to be, it's going to okay. be sort of like- One because, of my many weaknesses, thank you. There are many claims, um, you know, there are many claims um, uh, that you know are said about vibration platforms, and that I went through a Google uh, a search with a search engine, <laughs> and right. I I I came up with these claims, and I'd just be really interested to hear your very quick. <laughs> well, obviously not you know, baldness. Yeah. If you know, if you know, if you know anything about it, just to say, sort of quickly, if you know anything about it. So I'm going to go with that, and these. These are, this isn't just low intensity vibration. It's just if you knew anything about it and you could say potential, um, it, it could potentially be a claim. And if you feel, if you feel you want to sort of say no comment, that's absolutely fine. So these are some of the things I came up with. Um, yeah. So just be before you jump into it. So the device that, that is now being developed by BTT in Germany and, um, sold under LIVMD, Low Intensity Vibration Meridine. So Meridine is the company. Um, and again, conflict of interest. Uh, but it actually has a CE mark. So it can be sold in Europe as a treatment for osteoporosis. Yeah. It's a real pain in the neck to go to get a CE mark designation. And we use all of our scientific evidence to secure that. So what gives me the willies or the creeps are all these Vibration people say it's going to cure cancer, and it's going to cure baldness and blindness and, uh, and bone loss, et cetera. 
when they have zero evidence to do it. So if I say no comment, it usually means that if I'm smirking, it means I do have a comment, but I'm not going to say it. it I guess it's, um, and I'd be happy to chat to you about the longer versions another time. Um, yes. it's just, it, just, it would just be really interesting because I've got, I've got and, and some of the stuff that comes out, and I find it fun, some of the statements quite funny, actually. Okay, so here's the first one. Vibration slimming machines, weight loss. Um, I am aware of no evidence of it, although we scientifically show that we can suppress adipogenesis, the formation of fat from stem cells. And we actually do have evidence in our limited trials that shows suppressed fat in controlled clinical trials. But I would turn around and ask them, what double blind placebo controlled trials do you have to support that? So I say weak. So um, some of these things you might have already touched on, so we'll be able to skim, yeah. skim through. Develop muscle tone and then another term, body toning. So I'm just picking out how they've said it. Develop muscle tone, body toning. Um, well, again, I mean, with, with our specific signal, we've demonstrated that we can recruit stem cells, they're called satellite cells in muscle, and that we can change what's called the neuromuscular activity the electrical signal to, to a muscle uh, in both aging and young muscle with vibration. But again, I would ask them for their data that support their statements. Yeah, and That's also, I also typically in, the, in this commercial magazine type world, muscle tone is used to describe what something looks like rather than actually what a scientist might tell. Yes. <laughs> I love this next one. I love this next one. I think you're gonna love it. It literally said this, blood circulation said nothing else. It just said blood circulation. Uh, there is evidence. And a, an old colleague of mine from 25 years ago was very interested in what's called the second heart. So your calf muscles, when you're standing, when they contract, help to actually move blood out of your lower limbs and return. Imagine the problem a giraffe has. But when we're standing, you don't want blood to pool in your lower limbs. Yeah. And so the calf can actually, by contracting and being stimulated by walking, help move blood. So again, I would ask that company for their evidence. We actually have for Meridine, for LiveMD, claims for blood circulation. So I would say medium rather than weak. Okay. In that case. This one said lowers blood pressure. Don't know. No okay. comment. Increased strength. And I think we've kind of touched on that. Um, that probably, I think, is a calling card for the high intensity vibration people. So if you're an Olympic athlete and you need to run the 100 meter dash in 9.8 rather than 9.85 to beat to win the gold rather than silver medal, maybe it's going to help you transiently and you'll do anything to put your body at risk to make that gold medal. But if you're just going to the gym, staying in this device, imagine jumping off a desk 30 times a second, what that's doing to your knees. I'd yeah. say run away. Yeah. Improve posture. Couldn't tell you. Yeah. No. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm only thinking about um, my, my work. Sometimes I create um, turbulence and ask people to focus on their posture. But I mean, it just, the, the, the machine does that, I'm unsure. Improves so, so, yeah. so I will actually say that people who, you know, if I'm lucky enough that people, you know, believe some of what I say, and I hope they do, and I ask you to turn to the scientific literature, um, Google me on Google Scholar and you'll see all the, the papers that we've done that to stand on a device, I, I suggest they stand with knees straight, but in relaxed stance. And if you put your teeth together, you can feel, not to clench them, but you can feel them chatter very, very slightly. That's because of the transmissibility function. And then when you bend your knees very slightly, the chattering disappears. And so that's basically a signal that shows that the signal is being lost in other places. So it might be a prompt for improved posture. Stand straight. So you're saying they should be standing up? They should. Well, I, you, okay. no, you're, you're asking a different question okay. to what I'm answering. Okay. Saying that I could see that it would be a feedback system to help people. Ah, understood. Stand understood. straight. 
Got it, got it. Improves the mobility. Don't know. No comment. I, I'm just going to, I'm going to argue that it, we're not doing any mobility exercises while we're on the machine. Um, um, uh, well, if it's improved yeah. neuromuscular control, et cetera, with all these things, I would encourage your listeners to get to the manufacturer and ask for the science behind those statements. Not that Mrs. Jones Im the device and felt better, but a true scientific study in a peer Impro review. Improves balance. Uh, we've shown that. Yeah. Improves coordination. That I don't know. I don't know what that means. Yeah. Improves flexibility. Don't know. Uh, we've already got touched on improves bone mineral density. Will help with muscle and joint pain. My wife, we actually, you don't have time to hear about a study that we've done on low back pain. It's not yet published. But my wife, who doesn't believe a single word that I say, she stands on the device every single day, not to build her bone, but she's a devout runner. Mm -hmm. She says it makes her knees feel better. And many, many people write to me and say, gee, I don't know if it's building my bone, but boy, my hips sure feel better. So wow. anecdotal, anecdotal support for it, at least with low intensity vibration. Increases immunity and stimulates the lymphatic system. No, uh, that's, that's way over my head. Right. Decrease, decreases cortisol levels. Couldn't tell you. Okay. Improves quality of life and psychological well-being. I love what I do. So <laughs> there you go. And on that note, I think it's, a, I've, I had loads more questions, but I think it's a really nice way to, to end things actually. So, you know, I okay. mean, I think the big the big message is that the, the science is there and you're the man to go and look up. Yeah, thanks for your patience. Sorry I went on so long. That's okay. Uh, regards uh, to all your listeners. <laughs> thanks so much. All right, cheers. Bye-bye.